going to be in Matthew 6, 9 through 11. This is the word of the Lord. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. This is the word of the Lord. So in 1888, Alfred Noble arose to a morning paper that had his obituary listed. Shocked and in utter distress, he began nervously attempting to figure out why the public presumed him to be dead when he was very much alive. Well, as it turns out, Alfred's brother Ludwig had died of a heart attack in France a few days earlier, and the local newspaper had mistaken Ludwig's death for Alfred's. Sad as he was about his brother's death, what really upset Alfred was the obituary that was written, a scathing indictment on Alfred's life and career in the area of weapons of mass destruction. The obituary chillingly labeled Alfred, quote, the merchant of death, whose legacy was intertwined with his ability to develop new ways to, quote, mutilate and kill other human beings. The error was later corrected, but not before Alfred had the unpleasant experience of reading his own premature death notice. Can you imagine waking up and reading about your own death? Can you picture the out-of-body experience it would be to read in print the totality of your life and legacy whittled down to a singular paragraph for better or for worse? See, Alfred had the unpleasant but unique experience of witnessing his life flash before his eyes. And the dynamite king, as he was dubbed, was not pleased with what he saw. What about you? What about you? As you reflect on the totality of your life up to this point, what rises to the surface? How will you be remembered? And does this thought exercise elicit great joy and gratitude or overwhelming fear and contempt? So today we're continuing in our series of teachings that we've entitled Teach Us to Pray, which stems from this statement that a disciple or Talmud, an apprentice of Jesus, once asked. Here it is, Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus seems to offer an answer, a blueprint, a map for conversing with the God of the universe. And so last week, we focused on the opening line of this prayer, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father, Who is in heaven? Hallowed be your name. We talked about adoration and how, in order to know what to pray for, we must first establish who we are praying to. If you missed last week's teaching, we'd highly recommend that you go back and listen or watch on Apple Podcasts or YouTube as this whole series of teachings is going to flow together. So Jesus lays the foundation for the who of prayer. Prayer is a conversation with our Father in heaven, whose name is holy or set apart. And then Jesus then offers this next line, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Many of us pray, and at this point, after last week's teaching, I'm assuming, or at least hoping, it is to the God of the universe, the one true triune God, our Father in heaven, El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. And if it's not, we are so, so glad that you're here, and we'd invite you to keep coming and wrestling with these questions. But I have to be honest at the outset, Jesus is presupposing that this is who we're praying to before launching into this next bit. So if that's not the case for you, much of this teaching is going to feel radically countercultural. 
Much of this is going to feel radically countercultural to those of us who do follow Jesus. But it's within this paradigm that we seek to wrestle with the idea that many of us pray. The question now is, what are we praying for? Many of us pray. The question now is, what are we praying for? The ideas of submission and supplication flies in the face of our idealized individualistic selves. The title of self-made is akin to that of a superhero. We relish in the rags-to-riches stories where individuals have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and made things happen all on their own. Independence is our culture's currency of power. Author John Mark Comer puts it this way in his best-selling book, Live No Lies, which is available for sale in our recommended reading library out at the Info Hub. He says, quote, self is the new God, the new spiritual authority, the new morality. But this puts a crushing weight on the self, one it was never designed to bear. It must discover itself, become itself, stay true to itself, justify itself, make itself happy, perform and defend its fragile identity. Like all the most powerful ideas in our world, this one is so lethal because it's assumed to be true. To even question it is a kind of cultural heresy. To raise the same doubt in others is a gross crime, but the now ubiquitous mantra of be true to yourself raises a very interesting question. Which self? See, there is an assumed ideal self that we're all chasing. But how do we know when we've discovered or found it? We've invented different ways of cultivating environments that aid us in its supposed discovery. One of them being the famous festival Burning Man. This past year, an estimated 73,000 people known as burners, nice, edgy name, I dig that, gathered in the middle of the Nevada desert to, according to the USA Today, quote, create a kind of utopia. They build villages, a medical center, an airport, and performance stages. Burning Man is all about self-expression and the rejection of corporatism and capitalism. Instead of using money, attendees borrow, barter, and trade for what they need. As one attendee described it, quote, radical self-reliance is one of the principles of Burning Man. The desert will try to kill you in some way, shape, or form. Indeed, Burning Man encourages the individual to discover exercise, and rely on their inner resources. See, Burning Man is but a microcosm of our broader culture. We may not be congregating in the desert, but we are congregating online. And we may not be explicit in our fight for a utopian society, but the death grip on our progressive or conservative ideals fought for to the extreme certainly communicate an intense ache for peace and order and stability. Jesus, of course, knows all of this. And his invitation is to surrender the totality of our lives to him. In an age of radical independence, Jesus offers to us an invitation into holistic dependence. Where instead of hustling to make our name great, we hallow God's name alone. Where instead of grinding to make our will come to pass, we submit ourselves to the Father's will. And instead of scratching and clawing to establish our kingdom, we partner with God in establishing his kingdom. Instead of buying into the lie that we must do everything on our own, we humble ourselves and ask God the Father to provide in ways in which we cannot. This, in essence, is an integrated life. Where instead of buying into the cultural myth of the self-made man, we partner with Jesus in becoming the God-made woman or man we long to become. See, as followers of Jesus, we believe that as human beings made in the image of God, our only true identity can be found in the loving arms of our Father. It is this intimacy that Jesus offers to us in this prayer. The contemplative Thomas Merton writes, quote, The secret of my identity is hidden in the love and mercy of God. Therefore, I cannot hope to find myself anywhere except in him. Therefore, there is only one problem on which all of my existence, my peace, and my happiness depend. To discover myself in discovering God. 
If I find him, I will find myself. And if I find my true self, I will find him. Jesus of Nazareth offers to us a way to discover God, to find God. And it is in submission and supplication, in receiving and asking. You see, all of us worship. The question is what or who do you worship? The burners of Burning Man worship ideals like radical inclusion, immediacy, and self-expression. Followers of Jesus worship a man who is the way, the truth, and the life, who claims to be the only source of life everlasting. Everyone has a story or stories that they believe, ways to make sense of reality in life as we know it. And we take our cues from Jesus. And his cue here is to pray a radically countercultural script than that of the world, where rather than pursuing power, we receive peace. Rather than pursuing wealth, we open ourselves to wonder. And rather than pursuing fame, we are content to build friendship with God and to entrust our future to him. So we come to our teaching text, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've now entered the crux of the Lord's prayer. After acknowledging our Father in heaven, after declaring his name set apart, we now stand in solidarity with his agenda. We pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At its core, this is a prayer of submission. In our modern Western democratic free society, we have a difficult relationship with this idea of submission. If you have had any sort of religious upbringing, then generally speaking, as soon as I say submit to one another, many of you think, that's from that wedding passage, isn't it? If you grew up conservatively. Or you think, that's the opening to that oppressive passage about women, isn't it? If you grew up liberally. Right? So please understand, I know we're all coming to the text with a myriad of nuanced, specific experiences. But what we have to understand is that this idea of submission is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus' invitation constantly was, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves Take up their cross daily and follow me. See, this was an invitation into submission daily, of daily choosing to bear Jesus' name rather than our own, denying ourselves and surrendering to Christ. His pronouncement of good news was, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. To repent literally means to turn around to go a different direction, in essence, to give up your way of life and to submit to my, Jesus' way of life. And this pricks at all of our individualistic tendencies, doesn't it? But this is where the rubber meets the road. In praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are reorienting our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and our souls around the way of Jesus around a different story from the set of stories that the world around us has said regarding what leads to a life of flourishing. Since the beginning of time, this battle of kingdoms has been a constant in the war for our soul. Now, I want us to see this, so for just a moment, turn back with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, it's like the first few pages of the Bible. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, God's creation is at peace and harmonious and is exactly as he intended. And then the serpent, Satan, approaches Eve. So this is Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, 
For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. See, in just a few verses, we witness the tragedy of the human condition. Deception. A deceptive idea is implanted into the mind of a woman. Did God really say? Which causes her and her husband to question the desires of their own heart. These desires end up disordered. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And now, passed on through generations, what has been commonly referred to as sin has infected the world. Deceptive ideas playing to disordered desires which have been normalized in a sinful world. Life in Broad Ripple, or Fountain Square, or Butler Tarkington, or Hamilton County in 2024. The human condition. The human condition can be summarized in one line. Not as you will, but as I will. The tragedy of Eden is the first strike of the drum that is echoed throughout time in which we as sinful, broken, disordered human beings have emphatically and triumphantly attempted to replace God with ourselves. And in doing so, we have wreaked destruction on the world. Immorality, in essence, is the fruit of this declaration. God, not as you will, but as I will. Lying, cheating, stealing, war, violence, assault, manipulation, abuse of power, child slavery, sexual exploitation, racism, greed, envy, vengeance, all of it can be traced back to a deceptive idea playing to a disordered desire that has now been normalized by our sinful society. But the gospel, the good news The good news is that unto us a Savior has been born who came, who lived, and who revealed to us kingdom ethics summarized in a singular line. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This was a proclamation, an enunciation that the kingdom of heaven is here now. And that the way to find your life is to lose it. To submit your agenda, your desires, and your will to him. But my friends, it gets better. See, not only did this Savior talk the talk, he walked the walk. This was not lip service to appease a religious crowd. God incarnated himself. He appeared as a human being in a body on this earth. And he demonstrated for us what this kingdom looks like in action. It looks like good news for the poor, freedom for the oppressed, sight for the blind, healing for the sick, and salvation for the lost. It's an invitation he not only gave, but followed. Here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the return of Jesus. All of it hung in the balance in this moment. Just before this, Jesus confesses to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus, staring at the brutality, the pain, and the soon-to-come separation from God in the face is on the brink. 
Everything within him is saying, my will, my will, my will. I don't want to die. I don't want to be stripped and beaten and humiliated. I don't want to be betrayed. I don't want to do this. And are we really supposed to believe that Satan, the snake himself, was not present in that garden, whispering just as he once did to Eve, you will not certainly die, Jesus. You don't have to do this. Jesus tells his disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Everything within him is screaming, run, abandon ship, find another way, preserve, protect, watch out for yourself. But how does Jesus respond? Yet not as I will, but as you will. This is the Eden reversal, my friends. This is Jesus inserting himself into the human condition and beginning a new story, a new beginning, a new creation. We serve a Savior who, as Paul writes, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus' obedience opens the door for us to pray this singular transformational line and to mean it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ, Paul writes, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here now. And submissive prayer is the portal to seeing God's kingdom come to pass in our midst. So my friend, I ask you, are you longing for a move of God in your life? Are you hoping to get swept up in the story that God is writing? Are you wanting to see the things that have taken place on the pages of the New Testament take place in your own life? Then pray, the scriptures say. Pray. But don't just pray aimlessly. Pray for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done in your life. Believe it. And then watch what God does. All throughout the scriptures, this is the template we are given. Here's Ezra in 2 Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Here's the apostle James. You desire but do not have so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Here's the Apostle John. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Or again, in 1 John, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that what we have asked, that we have what we, what we have asked of him. That's a tricky line. This is the beauty and power of life with Jesus. See, in Jesus and within his will, prayer becomes the antidote to all of the evil, all of the pain, and all of the suffering which surrounds us. Heaven on earth begins to appear. The human tendency to consume, to hoard, to control, and to dominate, expressing itself in what the Bible calls the acts of the flesh, all of that transcends when we submit our will to God's will into the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which begins to permeate our lives because we're walking in step with the Savior in whom we trust. See, the temptation will be to leave here today praying these words. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Believing that the power is merely in its content and not in its character. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, whose will? Whose kingdom? Ah, yes, 
our Father in heaven, whose name is holy and set apart, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Here's the Apostle Paul in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. My friends, this is an invitation into participation. God does not need us to accomplish his will here on earth, but he loves you and me so much that he offers to us the opportunity of a lifetime to partner with him in the forming and fashioning of God's kingdom, his rule and his reign on earth as it is in heaven. But he's looking for a people with an undivided heart. Not a people who are using this line as a means to an end to get what we really want. No, he's looking for people who believe this. A people who are willing to say, declare, and believe, and live out. God, have your way. Let your will be done and change me. Show me. Transform me. Even when I do not understand or agree or accept what that prayer entails. That's a bold prayer, my friends. In fact, I'd argue that it might even be a dangerous prayer. But it's a prayer that our Father delights in answering. So we've now come to the transition point of this prayer. This is imperative for us to grasp. Up until this point, Jesus' prayer has been all about God. Your name, your kingdom, your will. But at this point, he shifts the focus. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. Now, for most of us, prayers of supplication or prayers of requests are really all that we've ever known or understood or practiced in prayer. So please hear me. God loves when we ask. He loves conversing with us. He loves hearing about what's stirring in our hearts or what's on our minds. My point is supplication fits into a broader framework of prayer. See, for so many of us, we have spent a lifetime making requests of God without taking the time to build a relationship with God. God has been reduced to some cosmic vending machine that if he hears us, great. And if he doesn't, well, I wasn't really expecting him to come through anyways. And what's happened is many of us have missed out on the opportunity of the beauty of experiencing God through prayers of adoration, through simply being with Jesus and sitting in his presence and letting his love wash over us. Worshiping him, glorifying him, letting his truth, his grace, his kindness, and his patience to just simply permeate our being. See, many of us skip the process of relational intimacy and go straight for the request of divine intervention. Who among us in any mature relationship would feel healthy in an arrangement where the only time we hear from someone is when they need something? So please, Please don't hear this as an admonishment to not ask. As we're about to find out, God loves when we ask. But prayers of request must be framed within the broader picture of union with God. Life with Jesus is about being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus by being obedient to God's will and surrendering to what it is that he wants to do in and through our lives and doing the things he did. And then, graciously receiving out of the overflow of that relationship, the provision and breakthrough that he offers to us. The New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, quote, The first half of the prayer is thus all about God. Prayer that doesn't start there is always in danger of concentrating on ourselves. And very soon it stops being prayer altogether and collapses into the random thoughts, fears, and longings of our own minds. So, Jesus says, give us today our daily bread. We have to remember that Jesus is teaching in a first century Jewish context. This image of bread would have immediately resonated with his original audience. When Jesus says bread, he means bread. Bread was a tangible sign of provision. He's saying, when you pray, ask for food on the table. 
Ask for God to supply what you need for this day. Ask God to come through for you in the minute details of your life. But at a broader level, Jesus, being the ninja Jedi teacher that he is, he uses this image that likely would have elicited memories for the Israelites of their ancestors and their exodus from Egypt. When they're in the desert, stranded, millions of men, women, and children with no food and no water in sight, what does God do? He provides manna, bread, from heaven. Here it is, Exodus chapter 16. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Far out, right? Like God's people have just been delivered from the oppression of the Egyptians, and then they find themselves in a place of lack, and instead of turning to God, they turn to grumbling. And yet God comes to Moses and says, I will provide the bread. I will provide enough for each day. And then look at how Jesus brings all of this full circle in John chapter 6. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to the believe in the one he has sent. So they, the crowds, asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That's beautiful, isn't it? He's saying, when you pray, pray and remember the ways that I've provided for you every day of your life up to this point, and pray that I would do it again. Pray to me, remain in me, lean on me, trust in me. I am provision himself. See, submission and supplication are both interwoven into this singular attribute, which is dependence. Dependence. We pray for God's will to overrule our will. We pray for God's provision to outweigh our provision. We rightly recognize that we are not in control. We are not in charge. And so we surrender to the one who is. Now, perhaps you're here today and you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. You've never even thought to ask God about you fill in the blank because you've just assumed it's too trivial. You've just assumed he wouldn't care. Or perhaps it's deeper than that. You've asked and have been left wanting. You've been disappointed. God's been silent, absent. And we'll talk more about that in a few weeks, so please come back. But today, my friends, please hear me. God cares about our daily needs. All throughout the scriptures, we are encouraged. Ask. Ask. Here's Jesus in Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Here's Matthew 21. And whatever you ask for in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Mark 11. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. John 15. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And John 16. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. See, asking or petitioning or praying prayers of supplication is at the heart of prayer. 
The theologian John Wesley wrote, quote, supplication, repeating and urging our prayer, as Christ did in the garden, is watching, inwardly attending on God to know his will, to gain power to do it, and to attain the blessings we desire. With all perseverance for all the saints, continuing to the end in this holy exercise, that others may do all the will of God and be steadfast. And then he finishes with this. Perhaps we receive few answers to prayer because we do not intercede enough for others. Jesus instructs us to pray daily for the things that we need. Give us this day our daily bread. The focus is singular, right? This day, not tomorrow, not next week, not in 10 years. What's the need of today? Sort of rings of another line of Jesus in this teaching, just a few verses later in Matthew 6, yeah? Here it is. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek. Seek what? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The theologian D.A. Carson commented, quote, This prayer is for our needs, not our greeds. That's bars. It is for one day at a time, reflecting the precarious lifestyle of many first century workers who were paid one day at a time and for whom a few days' illness could spell tragedy. March 15th, 2020. All of you just shuddered, right? The coronavirus shut down the world indefinitely, and all of these states start instituting a shelter-in-place policy. People are rushing to the grocery stores, hoarding, grabbing whatever we can to self-preserve. Toilet paper, gone, right? But I think about that time and how literally so many of us were living one day at a time, just trying to figure out the next day and the next day and the next day. Jesus is inviting you and I into that level of dependence now. Where every day upon waking, we say, Jesus, give us today whatever it is that we need. You've seen me to this point, and I trust and believe that you'll see me through today. One author writes that our daily bread might be better translated as, give us today the bread that we need to exist. There is nothing wrong with remembering the past. In fact, God often encourages us to remember his past acts of faithfulness. And there's nothing wrong with planning for the future. Wise stewardship of the resources entrusted to each of us requires wise planning. But Jesus makes it clear there is only one place to live, and that is in the here and the now. Tomorrow will worry about itself. In the wise words of the cartoonist Bill Keen, popularized for all of us Zoomers in the great film Kung Fu Panda, quote, Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift of God, which is why we call it the present. So much nostalgia, right? Now, just like last week when we dug into this line, Our Father, notice that the text does not say, Give me today my daily bread. It says what? Give us today our daily bread. Jesus is once again distinct in his naming of God as a communal God of all people, in all places, in all time. Whoever is willing to accept and acknowledge Jesus as Lord has access to the Father. He is our Father. We are His sons and daughters, and we all have access to pray for God to supply this bread of life to all who believe in Him. 
See, the fact of the matter is that you and I most likely are praying this prayer as someone who has food on the table, who has a bed to sleep in, who has a roof over our heads. Not everyone. And if that doesn't describe your situation, we are so, so glad that you're here and we want to help. Because the answer to this prayer in our cultural moment for those in desperate need often comes through us, through other people, through the church, through the people who have submitted their will to God's will. When we as individuals who have more than enough pray this prayer, our focus should be on the us and the our. Who among us is struggling? Who among us is lacking? And how might our prayer give insight into compassionately meeting the needs of those around us? See, perhaps for some of us, our prayer should be, as one commentator suggests, use me and others so that all of us may eat. See, submission and supplication is to surrender to the God who sees and to ask the God who loves to give. All in dependence on Jesus, the only one able to save himself. So my friends, as we close, this all begs the question, how then shall we live? What does it look like to leave this place committed to doing this stuff, to actually practicing what Jesus preaches here? Well, at an individual level, we start by praying for an undivided heart. Pray for an undivided heart. Here's the psalmist in Psalm 86. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. So pray And pray for an undivided heart rooted in love and reverence that is wholly committed to seeing God's kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then communally, we discern how we might faithfully step into the gap of the needs of our community. What if in our circles this week, we took some time to intentionally pray for the families in our neighborhoods who may be in need? What if we practiced what we preach? This is something that we'd love to invite all of us to do this week. Each circle leader has the option to email hello at sanctuaryindy.com this week, and we will give our circles a set dollar amount from our Mercy and Justice Fund to give our neighbors daily bread. And we'd encourage you, if you're in a circle, to prayerfully consider adding to your circle's fund individually to multiply the good in your neighborhood that your circle can do. And if you're not in a circle, we'd love for you to be in one. Please fill out a connect card so we can begin that process with you. We onboard twice a year, and the next opportunity is coming up in just a few months at the end of the summer. And if you're not in a circle, the invitation remains the same. Pray specifically for the people of your neighborhood this week. Gather a group of friends or your roommates or your family and find a way to provide daily bread to someone in need this week. Perhaps it's the homeless man on your street corner or the struggling single mom in your workplace or an elderly widow down the street. Perhaps you go and buy groceries and deliver them or throw a feast for a refugee family at your kid's school. Buy a gift card for a date night for young parents or an R&R night for a single parent. Whoever it is, here's the invitation. Do the stuff. Put into practice what Jesus teaches. Go and be the church. For all of us to aid us in our practice throughout this teaching series, we've printed what we call our Lord's Prayer Cards. And they're these tiny credit card sized cards that can fit into a wallet or a purse on a desk, a vanity. And we just encourage you, grab one or a few and put them where you'll see them throughout the day. And then just once a day, preferably at midday with all of us, but whenever you can, simply pray the Lord's Prayer. And this week, focus specifically on these two lines. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And we also have a recommended reading bookmark that looks like this with a bunch of amazing books on prayer that you can go pick up afterwards. And in partnership with our friends at the organization Practicing the Way, we have also crafted a beautiful prayer guide that you can use throughout this teaching series. And to access that, simply head to sanctuaryindy.com slash resources. So Alfred Noble read his obituary and realized that his life's work has amounted to a legacy as the merchant of death, a life where his gifts and his passions and his talents had been used not to bring life, but to destroy it. 
And the well-known dynamite king had come to a premature crossroads in life. He had to make a choice. Whose will would he pursue? His or God's? And although it's never been confirmed, the boy who grew up Lutheran before eventually becoming a lifelong agnostic left behind a legacy that resonates greatly with the ethics of Jesus of Nazareth. As one commentator writes, quote, Noble did not change his name, he changed his life. For those familiar with the story, Alfred would go on and change his will, allocating the majority of his vast fortune to a foundation that would hand out prizes to those pursuing shalom, peace, wholeness, human flourishing, something like heaven on earth. And in 1901, the very first Nobel Peace Prize was awarded. To this day, awards are still handed out every December 10th, the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's actual death. So my friends, don't wait until it's too late. Until an obituary is in the paper outlining all of the things you thought gave your life meaning but were really just tearing it apart. There's time today. As the Apostle Paul writes, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day to turn your life around, to submit to Jesus, to surrender your will to his will, and to partner with him in forming and fashioning a countercultural community of shalom, of flourishing, A people where none live in lack, where none go hungry, where daily bread is ever present, where heaven touches earth in the here and the now.